while deception and lies, as we're talking about, result from rejecting God and truth, and when God is rejected and when truth is rejected, well, then what's left? Well, it's an embracing of an ideology that is a counterfeit to God, the Bible, to morality and truth. And out of that come very specific evil techniques that are designed to break down people, to move them from positions of morality, from belief in God, to positions that are totally contrary. Where have we seen this? Well, we've seen it, and we talked about it just briefly the last segment. We see it oftentimes when there are prisoners of war in particularly communist camps of the past, North Korea of the past, and other places. But then an entire populations as well can be deceived as a group. We've seen that in China in the past, and I would submit that we're beginning to see it again on a massive scale in China. Now, our guest, Brandon Howes, in reading history and from the past and so forth, has identified 10 steps that are common, and I want to talk about just a couple of those with you right now, Brandon. The first strategic step that you identified, and again, this is your words. It's nobody's called it out in 10 steps. You've identified these positions or strategies, though. The first one you said was remove or discredit leaders who are principled or courageous and people of convictions and morality. You started with that one. So share briefly, how was this done in China and the North Korean prison camps? And then quickly tied into an example of how it's being done here in America today? Well, they identified immediately who were the um, men of courage, conviction, and who were prone to being leaders, uh, organizing. They, they uh, were quick to want to organize opposition and resistance. And if they could identify them, they would move them out of the way quickly, and they would move them to what they called reactionary camps. Many of them were deemed to be religious, and those that were deemed religious were seen to be absolutely hopeless as far as brainwashing them. That's very key to our closing remarks today. So if they were deeply religious, they already said, well, we really can't do much with them for brainwashing, and so they moved them out of the way. Interesting, again, those who were deeply religious and had strong convictions uh, were also the leaders. So not only were they prone to not being successfully brainwashed, they were the leaders. And so they had to be moved out of the way, and they went to what are called reactionary camps. That was about 5% of the POWs, according to the government study. So about 5% of the men had to be moved out of the way. Think about that in society today. If that number holds true in society, where you have about 5% of the people actually are the leaders uh, and the people of courage and conviction, it doesn't take much to move those 5% out of the way. So you start to, in reality, shadow ban, block, deplatform, label as hate speech, uh, racist, Brandon House, Sam uh, Roar, Jimmy D. Young, just go down the list of people that you know or any other conservative out there uh, on talk radio. You ban talk radio. Are you limited by um, fairness doctrine or hate speech and hate crimes that have done in Canada and Europe? And all of a sudden, you don't have any leaders anymore because they can't really speak, or if they can't If they do, they can be prosecuted and fined or put in jail. So this is how you move your leaders out of the way. And if you can't do it by that, and then you steal their credibility. You, you, you call them racist. You call them bigots. You call them homophobic. You call them Islamophobic. So you, you destroy those leaders. If you can't remove them and move them out of the way, you prosecute them. If you can't do that, then you first start by just simply destroying their character and credibility so they have no credibility to lead. All right, let's go to the middle. I'm going to pick the sixth one that you identified. Okay, you said this, apply punitive consequences on any worldview and values which are contrary to the chosen worldview and values being inculcated into the brainwashing subjects. All right, so communist atheism trying to be foisted upon an American prisoner of war who holds primarily generally to a biblical worldview, Judeo-Christian worldview at least. All right, that's an example of how they're trying to do that. How did they then do this, apply punitive consequences to forcibly kind of move them in the direction they wanted them to go? Well, of course, everyone always immediately thinks about torture and drugs, and not that that wasn't done, but it was very, very rare according to the government study, particularly in North Korea. In fact, they often gave them a little speech when they entered telling them that they weren't going to make them work at a hard labor camp and torture them and starve them. 
And so they sought to be their friend, tell them you're there because of the industrialists, the corporatists, the warmongers, the capitalists uh, is why you're here. So we're not going to take it out on you. All we ask for is your physical cooperation. So many people need to understand that brainwashing does not often involve any drugs or hypnosis or torture. And in fact, in many cases in North Korea, that wasn't involved at all. What they simply set up was a way of rewarding and punishing those who complied. So if you went along with the group consensus, then you could be rewarded. You might get better food. You might get a little bit better treatment if you went along and were one of their leaders and could be handpicked. If you didn't, you could get some consequences. And again, that could just simply be very simple things such as being shunned. So very, very common that if somebody didn't go along, was not following the plan, they would be shunned or what they did brought consequences onto the whole group so that it would bring in group consensus. And um, we do that in America now. We're setting up a system of, of, of punitive consequences on those who are not going along. And the way they're doing that in, in many areas, but one that's going to be very interesting because it comes right out of the communist China playbook, is setting up a real ID card, our smart card. Mm. It's now called Real ID or National ID. It's also coming out of the United Nations and Agenda 2030. But it's supposed to be launched in October of 2020. And then at that point, you won't be able to get on a an airplane. And in China, they've already been doing this. I've been writing about this since 1995 in my second book, and it's called a Dangan. And then a file is opened on them, and it tracks them. And their hiring, firing, job promotions, and ability to travel are all based on review of an applicant's Dangan and their political evaluations. That's coming to the world through Agenda 2030 and in America, the real ID. And in my program, I show you screenshots of news stations, NBC a station out of uh, Indianapolis, Indiana, that's openly stating, as are many, that after 2020, if they finally meet their deadline and implement this, you won't be able to get on an airplane. Now, you say, big deal. Well, in China, where they're doing this, if you speak out against the government, you can't get on an airplane. You speak out against the government, you can't get on high rail, high rail speed trains. If you speak out against the government, you can't get a loan. So they're able to control and shut down your entire life by tracking your attitudes, values, feelings, and emotions and tying it to this national ID card, which, by the way, Agenda 2030 and some of the documents I reveal from the government and the G20, they openly state they're going to track your attitudes, values, feelings, and beliefs. So when you get pulled over by a police officer and they've made and more and more of our police departments and sheriff departments corrupt, guess what? That police officer is going to be able to see who you are, what you believe, what your worldview is, and trust me, it'll start affecting how you behave. And when you go to single-payer health care, are you going to speak out against the government that can save your life or that of your family through single-payer health care? And they're going to know who speaks out against them. So they'll be able to ration health care and kill you that way, too. Yeah, Brandon, you are exactly correct. And, boy, we could spend a lot of time on that because when I was in the Pennsylvania House of Representatives, I led investigations on the matter of Real ID, which started way back. And it was pushed to the side to some extent because there were outcries, but it has continued to move forward. And, ladies and gentlemen, what Brandon just said, I can tell you, it is true. It is coming and it will have the effect of actually forcing people to do things, to give away your independence, to become a part of a system that loses your individuality, that allows for total control. It's being done at the highest levels. And as he said, the end of 2020 is when it is now back on target and it's being pursued. Now, this is just one example, again, brainwashing. Forcing people, leading people to accept positions, views of life, of freedom, of God, of accountability, totally different from what they would have ever viewed before. Again, if you need any more convincing, this is really very real. It's being used on us, but it's good to know how to do it. Brandon, in your study of particularly the prison camps of North Korea and elsewhere, you found that the people who did the studies on that, and I guess even some of those who were involved themselves, actually identified certain things that were, because I'd say inoculants perhaps, or at least things that were in place to help oppose brainwashing techniques. What were some of those? Well, the, the, the three words that came up in the studies from the 1950s, and again, these were not Christian studies. These were just men studying the problem. So they weren't looking to take this and say, okay, now let's turn this into a some kind of uh, Christian uh, solution. They were just simply studying it from the standpoint of the government and as researchers, and they came up with this independently of each other. 
uh, prayer, faith, convictions. Uh, this was it. This was, to a man, what co- stopped them from being brainwashed. Every one of them that was not being brainwashed stood for uh, – had strong convictions. They had faith in something outside of themselves, and that faith developed such strong convictions that it protected their mind from what was also referred to as the mind attack. And again, the Bible speaks to this issue about protecting the heart and the mind through a spiritual warfare, right? And so this is what they did. And, we, and, and to a man, they said that. And some of them remembered Scripture, and they worked hard to bring back the Scripture to their memory. Some of them actually were able to get a Bible after a period of time, and they made a regular practice of reading their Bible in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening. They would pray over their meal regardless of what the slop was that was put in front of them, and they had faith. And they didn't doubt that there was a, uh, a, a providential purpose or reason for what was happening. And so because they had strong convictions rooted in their faith, they had courage. So they had the courage of their convictions, and it protected their mind. And that's what the Bible says. Don't be cheated by the philosophies of men. That word correctly translated is lies or fables. And brainwashing is all about lies and fables, convincing you of the lie and convincing you the lie is really the truth. Well, how did they fight it off? By knowing what is the truth. And, of course, the Bible says, thy word is truth. He who sent me is true. So to a man, uh, these guys talked about faith, convictions, and prayer. And by the way, it could not just be something they were doing rote, you know, saying the Lord's Prayer, uh, rote, and just, just being involved in some kind of repetition, vain repetition. They openly stated you had to know what you believed, you had to know what you were saying or reciting, you had to have meaning to it and context and logic. It, if it was just rote memorization, or repetitive drill, it actually contributed to the fatigue, which added to the brainwashing. So you had to get to the heart and the meat of the spiritual context of their faith and their prayer.